Yeah, I guess it's probably time for the first speaker. Come on, the stage saga. So he's all yours. He's talking about unleashing webhooks with serverless, crafting a pop sub pipeline on Google Cloud Functions. That's Saga for you. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thank you for being here today uh, for this talk. And today we'll be talking about building webhooks using Google Cloud Functions Serverless Framework and Google Pops Up. We'll go through this uh, building process. We'll look at a, a use case where we're building, where we have an online store which communicates with our, our webhook. And then, yeah, we'll get started with that. Uh, a little bit about me. I am Sagar. I work as a senior software engineer at Finder. And you can find me at G GMR Sagar at LinkedIn if you want to connect. Let's take a look at the agenda that we'll be going through today. So first, we'll be looking at the components that you know, we'll be using today. Then we'll talk a little bit about serverless framework, what it is, and how we can leverage it. Um, then we'll look at the system flow or data flow of our system and how it's uh, built. Then I have a quick demo prepared for you all. So uh, we'll take a look at how we can do an end-to-end -end test of our requests, starting from our store all the way to our webhook. And finally, we'll take a look at how we can do some error handling around uh, pops up and Google Cloud Functions. Now, Webhook uh, has many uses, and one use case that I'll be demonstrating today is using uh, on, on an online store, which will be sending data to our Webhook. So let's say uh, we have an online store, which uh, users can go and buy stuff at. And it is in integrated with uh, Stripe. Now, Stripe is a payment system. Uh, so when our users go into our store, they'll and when they want to make a payment, they'll actually go into the Stripe's checkout, and then that, that's where they'll make the payment. And our webhook is connected to Stripe in such a way that when this payment even happens, it'll send a notification to our webhook. Now, uh, we'll do a deep dive into the webhook itself uh, down the line, but let's take a look at the components that we'll be using today. And uh, these are the four major components that we'll be talking about. And starting with webhook. Now, what is a webhook? Uh, webhook is simply put a mechanism uh, that is used in web development. This uh, allows sending automated messages from service to service. Um, and webhook employs something called uh, a subscription model. Now, what this is is, let's say we have two services, uh, service A and service B, and they want to uh, communicate with each other. Then service A, uh, let's say service A wants to need, needs to know the uh, info when any database change happens in service B. So service A will first need to subscribe to that specific event. So it'll need to tell service B that when a database uh, change happens, just send me a message on that. And service B then sends a message whenever that happens. Uh, so this means that uh, in Webhook, we have a uh, we send data in response to a specific event. So when something happens, we're sending a notification. And uh, with all the resources in web, uh, our webhook will also need to have a public URL. Just, it, it's just like an endpoint for our APIs. Now, traditionally, if we talk about this, it, it was done with something called polling. Uh, uh, what polling is is that service A will continuously check for updates in service B. And if we take a real life example of this, it is like, uh, you going into the post office every hour to check if you have a mail. Whereas Webhook would be something like having a mailbox into your home and you subscribe to the service. So when you you have a mail in your name, the, like the service will just come and drop the mail. The second component is a message queue. Uh, <clears throat> it, it is a um, asynchronous service to service communication. So what's interesting about message queue is that 
the sender and receiver, they don't necessarily need to interact with each other directly. So uh, a sender will send a message in the queue and the receiver will uh, get that message down the line. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so uh, these are the two major paths of uh, messaging queue. So one is the producer, the service or app that's pushing the messages into the service queue. And another is the consumer, which is consuming or receiving the message. Now, Google Pops Up uh, is a fully managed messaging queue service, and it has like pretty cool features built into it. And one of the features that we'll be using today is uh, Google's distribution model, uh, called Pops, uh, like publishing a subscribing model. And the pattern we're using is a uh, fan out pattern. So what this is is, let's say we have a message coming into uh, our Google Pops Up's queue, then Google knows to Pops Up News knows to send that message to all the uh, subscribers. So this is like a one-to-many relation. So one message is being pushed to multiple subscribers. The other component is Google Cloud Functions. Uh, Google Cloud Functions is a function as a service uh, service that allows us to deploy uh, functions and services into a compute environment. This is also fully managed by Google. So we don't need to really worry about service scaling and stuff. So depending on the amount of requests coming in, it can scale out, like create new instances of the function to handle the requests. Uh, Google Functions can be, uh, we can attach triggers into Google Functions. So it can be uh, uh, you, uh, even driven function or HTTP driven. So when something happens, like a database change, then we can trigger that function. Or let's say we have an HTTP event that's coming in, which can trigger the function as well. And finally, we have serverless framework. Uh, serverless framework is a toolkit that allows deploying uh, apps into the cloud functions. This is almost like an infrastructure as a code where we define all our infrastructure needs, all our functions into a serverless YAML file. And then serverless will bundle all that up, package it, and deploy it into any, any web provider we choose. So serverless is, has a multi-class multi support, so we can use AWS or Cloudflare. And in this case, we're using Google Cloud. Now let's take a look at a high level uh, system design uh, that we'll be using today. So uh, it starts, the whole thing starts when a user goes into the store and makes a payment. Then our uh, app, our payment system, it makes an API call to Stripe. <clears throat> Stripe then creates a new event called payment, like payment happen event. And our function, so the producer function, it's actually subscribed to that specific event. So Stripe sends a web request to the producer function and the producer function will push a message into pops up. Now our consumer function, which is the last function, it, it is subscribed to that uh, message. So now pops up knows to send that message into our consumer function, and finally it closes out the transaction. Now yeah, how does serverless uh, framework tie into this? Uh, so for, for serverless to deploy uh, into, into our Google Cloud, it needs to do a couple things. So first, uh, serverless will authenticate with GCP, so we're using Cloud IAM uh, service accounts for that. Then when we trigger a serverless deploy, it will bundle all that up, all our functions up, and it will push into cloud storage. And then finally, from cloud storage, it will build out cloud functions. And this is a quick look at the serverless sample. Uh, you can scan the QR code if you want to visit the GitHub repo for the serverless stuff. But yeah, this is a pretty standard YAML file. So going from top to bottom, we have the service. So this is just the name of the service. So GCP webhooks in our case. Provider is what cloud provider we're using. It's Google for us. And framework version is a standard like the version of the framework. Plugins is where we can add, like when we can choose our uh, serverless, our mm, cloud provider. So serverless Google Cloud Functions refers to Google. We can add others as well. Package is a standard. It's the code that we want to include or exclude from our package. And functions is where uh, all the magic happens, actually. So if we look at line 23, it's clear, yeah. uh, uh, you can see the name uh, producer. So that will be the name of our first function that we're deploying. Handler refers to the function that's bound, that will be bound to our function, the producer function. So going to the next slide. So the, the function that's exported at the end of the file, so the HTTP function, so that's, that, that function will be bound to our producer function. And event is just a trigger point of our function. So for our producer function, the trigger point is HTTP request. And moving on to the consumer function, uh, it's the same thing. So consumer is the name of the function. Uh, handler is what functions get bound to this consumer. And event is 
what event we're listening to. So in this case, for consumer, the event is uh, a message published. So whenever a message or a topic comes into uh, the pops up queue, uh, the, this function is triggered. And the resource type is Stripe transaction. So that means the topic of the message should be Stripe, Stripe transaction. And yeah, this is the function file that we wrote. So this is what gets bundled and sent into deployed into cloud functions. And yeah, uh, this is a quick look at what happens when we run serverless deploy command. So first, serverless goes on. Uh, it compiles our two functions, so producer and consumer. Then it uploads those artifacts into Google Cloud Storage. And then finally, it deploys our functions. So consumer has a event trigger of a Stripe transaction topic, and producer is exposed to using that endpoint. Now, uh, before Stripe can send us any uh, event notifications, we'll need to set up a webhook endpoint on Stripe itself. Uh, the process itself is pretty easy and pretty intuitive. In the Stripe, um, Stripe's dashboard, if you take a look, uh, we can go into webhook and we can just add our endpoint there. So the field, yeah. uh, the field here will be the endpoint to our producer function, so the one we deployed earlier, so this one. And we can choose what events we want to subscribe to, and like mm, Stripe has a lot of events, so for this, uh, for today, we're using the payment intended succeeded event. So this event triggers when uh, any users come into the system and make a payment. And this is just a log on Stripe's end to see what uh, messages were created and what requests were sent to our webhooks. Now Stripe has uh, an internal thing where if a message fails, it resends automatically, or we can manually resend the message as well. Uh, now let's take a quick look at the demo that I have today. Let's uh, bring my screen into there. So this works. Nice. Yeah, so this is just a demo store that I prepared where users can go and buy a very expensive picture. <laughs> So yeah, uh, as you can see, we're taking, uh, we're, we're being redirected to the Stripes checkout. Uh, this is just a sandbox, but this is what would happen. Now, if we go at just write a test email, test card, 24, 3, test, test. Now let's hit pay. Processing. Yep, so the payment went successfully, and this is the object payload that gets sent to our webhook, uh, the, the endpoint. Now let's take a look at this Stripe's dashboard to see if a payment, uh, if a notification has been triggered. And yeah, looks like one message went through, so this is real state. Now I'll be looking at uh, our logger, uh, logs for both of the functions. So this is the first function. So this is the, the producer function. So when Stripe sends a message uh, into our producer function, it should have a trigger, like Google uh, should have created a new instance of this message. Okay. Cool. So if I run this query, there should be some indication of, yeah. So a function execution started, so Stripe sends the message, we received that message, and Producer uh, took that message and it, uh, it published that into the pop shop. And, yeah. and this is our consumer function. So since that message was published into our pop shop pipeline, our consumers should have received that message as well. So if we look at the query, yep, so the function execution started at 43 and the transaction was marked complete. Now let's take a look at handling errors. Um, what if our pops up dispatches a message, but then our subscriber doesn't acknowledge it? So maybe our subscriber didn't receive the message or something went wrong, or what can we do? So there's a couple things that, uh, that happens. So one is retry. <coughs> Google pops up uh, does something called immediate retry. So whenever a message fails, like whenever it's not acknowledged, it tries sending the message again to the same subscriber, and if it fails again, it'll try sending that again. Now, we can see where this might not be effective because if the thing, that the, if the issue that failed, uh, that, didn't, that failed the uh, consumer function uh, hasn't been fixed, then retrying this over and over again would not help. So for that, 
Google has implemented something called exponential back off. Now what this is, is we can add a delay between uh, each retry. So let's say our, our message fails, we do a first retry, that fails, then we can add some delay between the second retry. And if that second retry fails, then we can increase that delay even more. So this gives us some chance to go in to our functions and see what's going on and fix it, hopefully. Uh, the other thing we can inc implement is something called a dead letter queue or dead letter topic. Now, this is just a standard queue or a standard queue where uh, all the failed messages go and sit or, you know, go to die. <laughs> and uh, so this is not by, this is not available by default. Like, we need to set this up in the subscribers ourselves. Uh, and what we can do here is we can add, attach a maximum delivery attempt. So we can tell pops up that if the delivery fails like five times, then you can pop that message out of the main queue and put it into our uh, dead letter queue. So we can go in there and take a look at what's going on with these other messages. Um, other than that, we can do some, or we can add some monitoring around the retry. So if message uh, fails, then we can get notifications on Slack or something. And <clears throat> we can also use service logs provided by Google. So for cloud functions, uh, the one we look, looked at just before, and also for pop subs. Uh, yep. And that brings us to the end of the talk. Uh, thank you all for being here. I hope this was a bit helpful and that works. And yeah, also big thanks to GDD Sydney for letting me uh, present today. So, and I'm open to any questions that I might have. Hi. So my question is, why did you choose the framework serverless? So uh, is there, there, there are many other frameworks like uh, serverless, so uh, why do you choose this one? Uh, good question, thanks. Uh, yeah, for me, uh, serverless, I mean, I, be, I use serverless as my daily driver at my work. So for me, uh, uh, serverless kind of makes it very easy to write functions, and I get to think in terms of code rather than infrastructure. So I just think what code I want to deploy rather than like specific infrastructure and other things, so. Thank you. Uh, my question. Any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Wait. Hi there, uh, good presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask, how does the current uh, deployment work if you want to deploy with a secure networking environment in, in like a private virtual network if the client wants it all the data being transferred only in their network where does that come in in the design if it does uh, for this one uh, for what the demo that we saw I haven't implemented anything like that but like if we want mm, we can set our all our like, for functions within one environment and just expose our producer function out so in that way it'll be secure like, all the data will be within our environment only they probably will take a last question, if there is anyone. Nope. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>